thanks. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, breaking news, a 360 exclusive. You'll not see this anywhere else. One of only six individuals who knows what it's like to decide George Zimmerman's fate. One of the six members of the jury that acquitted him. Juror B37, at her request, we are concealing her identity. For the first time anywhere, she is speaking out. She's the first juror to do so, to speak out publicly, the first to talk about how she saw all the powerful testimony that all of us saw, which testimony resonated with her and the other jurors, which evidence persuaded her and the other five women on the panel. What happened exactly inside that jury room? What does she think really happened the night George Zimmerman shot and killed Trayvon Martin? There's that, whether she thinks race played a role and a lot more. Here's part one of our exclusive conversation. When you first sat down on the jury, when you first gathered together, what was it like? Did you know how it big this was? It was unreal. It was unreal. It was like, it was like something that, why, why would they want to pick me? You know? Why would I be picked over all these hundreds of people that they interviewed? And when the trial started, what was the first day like? The op there were the opening statements. Um, Don West told a joke. What did you think of that? The joke was horrible. <sighs> I just, nobody got it. Knock, knock. I didn't get it till later, and then I thought about it, and I'm like, I guess that could have been funny, but not in the t context he told it. Going into the trial, did you have an idea in your mind about what happened? No, because I hadn't followed the trial at all. I mean, I had heard of bits and pieces of, of what had happened and the names that were involved, but not any details. So, I... so take me back, if you can, to the, that first day, the opening statements. What do you remember about them? What stood out to you? Not a whole lot, because it seems like it's been years ago that it really? happened. It does. It seems like it's been a very long time that we were there. W was there... A particular witness that that stands out to you well, who did you find to be the most credible the doctor in stop and i don't know his name the the doctor for the, the defense called y yes right yes what about him i thought he was awe-inspiring the the experiences he had had over in the war and i i just never thought of anybody that could recognize somebody's voice yelling in like a terrible terror voice when he was just pre previously a half hour ago playing cards with him. Oh, this, w this was the witness that, uh, the friend of George Zimmerman's who had had military experience. No, that was, this was the defense. Oh, this was the, the, the yeah. defense medical examiner. Yeah. Okay. What, um, what was it like day by day just being on that jury? Day by day was interesting. There were more interesting things than others. When they got into the evidence, it was, it was a lot more interesting than just testimony. Some of the witnesses, some of the witnesses were good, some of them not so good. Did you feel, a lot of the analysts who were watching the trial felt that the, the defense attorneys, Mark O'Mara, Don West, were able to turn prosecution witnesses to their advantage? Chris Serino, for instance, the lead investigator. Did, did, did he make an impression on you? Chris Serino did, um, he, but he, to me, he just was doing his job. He was doing his job the way he was doing his job, and he was going to tell the truth regardless of who answered the, asked him the questions. So you found him to be credible? I did. Very so when, credible. So when he testified that he found George Zimmerman to be more or less an overall truthful, did that make an impression on you? It did. It did. It made a big impression on me. Why? Because he deals with this all the time. He, de he deals with, you know, murder, robberies. Um, he's in it all the time. And I think he has a knack to pick out who's lying and who's not lying. The prosecution started off by saying that George Zimmerman was on top in the struggle. And then later on, they seem to concede, well, perhaps Trayvon Martin was on top, but maybe was pulling away. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the prosecution really had a firm idea of what actually happened? I think they wanted to happen what they wanted to happen, to, to go to their side to, for the prosecution of the state. Um, there was a lot, you know, the witnesses that the defense had on, plus some of the prosecution witnesses, um, there was no doubt that they had seen what had happened. Some of it was taped, so they couldn't rebuke any of that. What was on the 911 tape? Mm -hmm. 911 How tapes and the John Good calling and all of that. How significant were those 911 tapes to you? 
the Lauer tape was the most significant because it, it, it went through before the struggle, during the struggle, the gunshot, and then after. You had the, the parents of Trayvon Martin testifying. You had the family of George Zimmerman, friends of George Zimmerman testifying about whose voice it was in the 911 call. Mm -hmm. Whose voice do you think it was in the 911 call? I think it was George Zimmerman's. Did everybody in the jury agree with that? All but probably one. And what made you think it was George Zimmerman's voice? Because of the evidence that he was the one that had gotten beaten. So you think because he was the one who'd, who had had cuts, had abrasions, he was the one getting hit, he was the one calling for help? Well, because of the witnesses of John Good saw him, saw Trayvon on top of George, not necessarily hitting him because it was so dark he couldn't see, but he saw blows down towards George. And he could tell that it was George Zimmerman on the bottom. He didn't know who it was, but he knew what they were wearing. The one, the juror who didn't think it was George Zimmerman's voice, who thought it was Trayvon Martin's voice on that call, do you know why they felt that way? Well, she didn't think it was Trayvon. She just said she, it could have been Trayvon's. So she wasn't even sure? No. She wanted to give everybody absolute out of being guilty. But you were sure it was George Zimmerman's voice? I was sure it was George and the, Zimmerman's. And everybody else in the jury was? Except for that I think one person. So. I think they were. I, I don't think there was a doubt that everybody else thought it was George's voice. I want to ask you a bunch of the, uh, uh, I want to ask you about some of the different witnesses. Um, Rachel Gentel, mm -hmm. the woman who was uh, on the phone with uh, Trayvon Martin mm -hmm. uh, at the start of the incident. What did you make of her testimony? I didn't think it was very credible, but I felt very sorry for her. She didn't ask to be in this place. She didn't ask, she wanted to go. She wanted to leave. She didn't want to be any part of this, this jury. I think she felt inadequate toward everyone because of her education and her communication skill, skills. Um, I just felt sadness for her. You felt like, what, she was in over her head? Well, not over her head, she just didn't want to be there. And she was embarrassed by being there because, because of her education and her communication skills that, that she just wasn't a good witness. Did you find it hard at times to understand what she was saying? A lot of the times. Because a lot of the times she was using phrases I have never heard before and what they meant. When she used the phrase, uh, creepy ass cracker, mm -hmm. what did you think of that? I thought it was probably the truth. I did think Trayvon probably said that. And did you see that as a, a negative statement or a, a racial statement, as, as the defense suggested? I don't think it's really racial. I think it's just everyday life. The type of life that they, they live and how they're living and the environment that they're living in. So you didn't find her credible as a witness? No. So did you find her testimony important in terms of what she actually said? Well, I think the most important thing is, is the time that she was on the phone with Trayvon. So you basically, hopefully, if she heard anything, she would say she did, but the time coincides with George's statements and testimony of time limits and what had happened during that time. I, I explain that. Well, because there was a, George was on the 911 call while she was on the call with Trayvon and um, the times coincide, and I think there was two minutes between when George hung, hung up from his 911 call to the time Trayvon and, and Rachel had hung up. So really nothing could have happened because the 911 call would have heard, the non-emergency call that George had called, heard something happening before that. She said at one point that she heard the sound of wet grass. Did, did that seem believable to you? Well, everything was wet at that point. It was pouring down rain. We're going to have a lot more tonight. Uh, just had much more from Juror B37. Again, you'll only see it here. Literally just completed this interview right before we went on air. Coming up next, defense attorneys Mark Romero and Don West react to, uh, to this juror, what she is saying. You'll also hear from the prosecution. Let us know what you think. Follow me on Twitter right now, at Anderson Cooper. I'm tweeting about uh, some of the things this juror is saying. We'll be right back.